Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Bird, and I'd first like to uh, welcome everybody to this online seminar uh, where we're going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea uh, and the treatment and management. Um, I am a uh, assistant professor at the University of Texas at Houston in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, and have been um, treating obstructive sleep apnea since '07. Approximately 50 to 70 million Americans uh, suffer from sleep disorders. Most adults uh, require at least seven hours of sleep daily. Um, when they start going less than that, that's when we, we start running into problems. Um, in 2009, the CDC did a survey where approximately 75,000 adult respondents reported less than 35 percent of, of, of a seven-hour sleep period in a 24-hour period. Of those, 35 percent, 48 percent reported the snoring. The thing that you want to keep in mind, though, when you're talking about obstructive sleep apnea, not everybody with obstructive sleep apnea actually has snoring. Um, if you look in the literature, uh, it can range anywhere from um, 48 percent up to 70 percent of people reporting simultaneous snoring with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, what is sleep? Um, sleep is a naturally reversible state, um, and it's when we are we have the absence of consciousness, and it's when our bodily functions are are partially suspended. So we have these these times during sleep where we actually do have body function, and then where we where we don't. We also know that during sleep we have a heightened anabolic state, and this is where the body recharges. Um, and specifically, our immune system, nervous system, and musculoskeletal systems recharge. They rejuvenate um, during this time. Sleep can uh, be divided into, or the sleep cycle can be divided into non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Um, we know with the non-REM sleep, that makes up 75 to 80 percent of the sleep cycle. Um, REM sleep makes up the other 20 to 25 percent. We do know that REM sleep is the good sleep. That's the restorative sleep. That is the sleep that everyone needs. And when you miss that, that's when we start getting into problems. Um, the, the sleep cycle can further be divided into, or the, the non-REM and REM sleep can further be divided into stages. Um, we know in non-REM sleep there are four stages. Um, and there are distinctive patterns on EEG when we're, we're performing the polysomnogram or the sleep study that help us identify these different stages. We know in REM sleep, um, again, making up that 20 to 25 percent of the sleep cycle, we also have a distinctive EEG pattern that helps us distinguish this from the other non-REM sleep stages. Um, we spend approximately one-third to half of our lives sleeping. So that, that's a considerable amount. Um, from a physiologic standpoint, we, we really are still learning and don't completely understand why we physiologically need that good REM sleep, that restorative sleep. We're learning. Sleep medicine is evolving. Um, and we're, we're slowly beginning to gain a better understanding of this sleep physiology, but still don't have the complete picture. Well, what is sleep apnea? Sleep apnea or apneas are when you actually have a pause in breathing. Um, this pause can last anywhere from a few seconds to minutes. Um, it, it occurs throughout the entire sleep cycle and, and may occur from anywhere from 5 to 30 times per hour or even more during, during a night's sleep. Sleep apnea is synonymous with sleep disordered breathing, specifically in children. Obstructive sleep apnea uh, is when we actually get these pauses, but these pauses are actually caused by a physical airway blockage. So something is, 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 is blocking your airway temporarily. Important terminology that we need to kind of understand before we you know, go on further in the talk, we know that apneas um, is when you actually have no respiratory effort and a complete pause in breathing. This can be, uh, has to be greater than 10 seconds. Hypopneas are when we actually have a low respiratory rate. 
that results in a decrease in the oxygen saturation in the blood. And what we're primarily looking for, we're looking for an apnea hypopnea index, which is a number. And this number uh, signifies the number of apneas and hypopneas that occur per hour during sleep. We also are looking for what we call a respiratory disturbance index. Um, and again, this is a number. And this measures the frequency of apnea hypopneas per hour during that recorded time of sleep. Um, and these are, these are the things that we're primarily looking for when we perform a, a polysomnogram or sleep study. Now, obstructive sleep apnea can be graded. Um, we know an apnea hypopnea index less than 5 is normal. Um, 5 to 15 is mild obstructive sleep apnea. 16 to 30 is moderate. Um, severe is greater than 30. So that means 30 times per hour someone is obstructing. That's what that, that means. Um, some, of the, some of the other areas of sleep disordered breathing or definitions, um, certainly obstructive sleep apnea, um, where we have these pauses. We can also have obstructive hypoventilation syndrome that we're seeing more and more of because obesity is on the rise. This is usually the obese patient. Um, that patient is unable to fully expand the lungs because of body habitus, so they hypoventilate. We also have upper airway resistance syndrome, where you actually have these pauses, but don't have the desaturation. Your oxygen saturation remains normal. We also have primary snoring. Again, keep in mind, when you, when you talk about primary snoring, this can occur in someone with obstructive sleep apnea anywhere from 48 to 70 percent of the time. So why, why does obstructive sleep apnea occur? Um, we know from the five stages you know, of sleep, we have non-REM and REM sleep. In REM sleep, this is when we have complete paralysis of the body. So we have no more uh, muscle function. Um, and what I, what I tell patients when I, when I see them, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea is an anatomic problem. Um, certainly, we know obesity can contribute to that anatomic problem. And that's when we can, we can get, delve over into the hypoventilation syndrome, where we're unable to expand because of the body habitus. We also know that redundant soft tissue uh, can lead to these, these sites of obstruction, specifically the soft palate, tongue base, um, at those levels. We can also have uh, retronathia, which is a small jaw, which again causes redundant tissue being pushed to the back of the airway. Um, sleep apnea can also result from decreased laxity, decreased muscle tone. Um, you get collapse of the airway because you lose that muscle tone. The tissues are just lax and you're unable to keep those things, your body is unable to keep the airway open. We know um, deviated uh, nasal septum can contribute um, to the obstructive sleep apnea problem, but it's not a direct cause, not a primary cause. It can worsen it but it is not the primary cause of the obstructive sleep apnea. When we, look at, when we look at obstructive sleep apnea from a physics standpoint, we know that pressures are what maintain uh, airway opening um, and keep flow normal. So if we look at this, the bottom, uh, we look at the bottom, this bottom um, picture, we can see that Upper, the upstream segment and the downstream segment pressures are greater than 